before we get started talking about hunting herd bulls, I want to stress something very important, and that is the fact that I am not a professional hunter. I'm a regular guy who loves elk hunting, just like most of you. So what I'm up here telling you is my style of hunting, some experiences I've had, but it's not the right way. It's not the only way to hunt. So I'm not here to say that my way is perfect and it's going to work every time for you or that I'm the greatest elk hunter in the world because that's certainly not true. Just here to share some of my passion and, and excitement for elk hunting. And if it adds to your, your bag of tricks and makes you a better elk hunter, that's great. If it keeps you awake for an hour and gives you a soft chair, that's great as well. So afterwards, I'll try to get done with a good 15 or 20 minutes left so we can do some question and answers. That's my favorite part of it because I learned from that. I learned from your questions and the experiences you've had. So we'll do that. We've got a box of cookies Mrs. Fields has given to us back there. So feel free to get up and get some cookies or grab some on the way out. And then at the end, if you've been to my seminars before, we love giving away free gear. So we've got a box full of free gear up here. And I like to reward people who ask questions during the question and answer. And then whatever's left at the end, we'll bring some kids up here and just have them throw it out and go crazy. So we'll jump into it and get started. But first, I want to make sure we have elk hunters here. I'm going to take a little quiz. You might be an elk hunter if your one and only rule for setting the wedding date is not in September. <laughs> or if you plan the births of your children around the month of September. Or if your child's first word is elk. You might be an elk hunter if you locate your wife and kids at the store by whistling like an elk bugle. Or for the ladies, if you answer your husband's bugle with a cow call. Or if you call the kids in for dinner with an elk bugle. You might be an elk hunter if you have more pictures of elk in your wallet than of your family. Show of hands. All right. Or if you spent more days in the woods than at work. You might be an elk hunter if you spent more time raking trees than you did raking your yard last year. Or if you hiked for days in rugged canyons but a walk through the park with your wife is too hard. You might be an elk hunter if you have a hoochie mama and your wife is okay with it. Or if your most expensive clothes are camouflage. You might be an elk hunter if you have a urine scent wafer hanging from your rearview mirror. Show of hands. That's nasty. No. <laughs> you might be an elk hunter if you think Cameron Haynes is cooler than Tom Brady. Or if you remodel your home to fit in your elk mount. So how many elk hunters do we have here now? All right. Well, we're going to talk elk hunting today. We're going to talk a lot about success. If we're out in the woods hunting, we've got a tag in our pocket. We're carrying a weapon around the season's open. We want to fill that tag. But a successful hunt doesn't necessarily mean that you've killed something or filled a tag. And I want to make sure to stress to you that as I talk about successfully hunting herd bulls today, that that's not the real definition of success for me. Success is defined by you. When I go out in the elk woods, if I learn something, and it's usually learned through failure, that's a success. As long as I can apply something to make me a better hunter. If I go out in the elk woods and I call in a bull elk and he comes screaming in my face and my adrenaline's going crazy, that's a successful elk hunt to me. So when we talk about successfully hunting a herd bull and putting our tag on it, I don't want you to get caught up in the fact that I'm stressing that you have to kill an elk every time out to be successful because that's certainly not the, not the truth. It's not a competition between elk hunters. I don't go out to the woods to compete against my neighbor and say I've got to kill a bigger bull than him. I don't worry about score when I'm elk hunting. I go out there and I look for a bull that, that gets me excited and it is representative of a herd bull in the area I'm hunting, and I'm more than happy with that regardless of what he scores. We hunt in Idaho primarily, over-the-counter tags, public land. If we can find a 300-inch bull, we're usually pretty lucky. And the representative bull up there, a herd bull, might be to 260, 270, class 6 points. So score's not a big deal to me. I just want to find a bull that's representative of the area I'm hunting. I love the challenge of hunting a herd bull. It's uh, one bull, one animal out of that entire herd that I'm focused on. It's a lot more challenging. And with a greater challenge comes a greater reward at the end if, if I'm able to be successful. So, success rates for elk hunting. I'm going to run a little quiz here real quick. I want everyone who bought an elk tag last year to stand up. All right, so we've got probably 75, 80% of you bought an elk tag last year. If you did not shoot an elk last year, go ahead and sit down. Well, that got rid of about two-thirds of you. If you shot a cow last year, go ahead and sit down. <laughs> All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen out of, say, 150 in here. So 10% killed a bull last year. So if you shot a spike or a raghorn last year, go ahead and sit down. If you shot a five-by-five five last year, go ahead and sit down. 
Larry Raccoon standing shot a six pointer better last year. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine out of about 150 people shot a six point last year. We're beating the odds. That's great. If you shot a six point last year, go ahead and sit down. So two or three of you shot a seven point or bigger last year. Congratulations, that's awesome. Okay, go ahead and sit down. So I love doing that demonstration to show true success for archery hunters especially, but for elk hunters in general, it's not that high. Now we show a 25 or 30% in this room, which means we've got an accomplished group of elk hunters in here, but on an average, overall statistics say that successful elk hunts are about 10%. So one elk hunter out of 10 is killing an elk every year, or for an average elk hunter, you're killing one elk every 10 years. Now, if you throw in the fact that there's some people who kill multiple elk every year, that throws the odds even farther down for the folks that are down on the bottom end of that learning curve. Success on a herd bull, we saw that we saw it proven right here in the statistics, but two to three percent success on a herd bull. And if you look at states, a lot of states publish those statistics, they're right in line with that two percent. You're hunting a wiser animal, a more mature animal who survived 10 or 12 hunting seasons sometimes. You're hunting within a herd where there's more eyes and ears and noses and senses alive trying to keep them alive. And you're hunting less targets. As I mentioned, you've got one animal out of a herd of 30 or 40 sometimes that you're focusing on. So why do we want to hunt a herd bull? You like big elk, right? Elk fill the freezer and that's great. And I'll shoot a spike, you know, the last two or three days in a heartbeat, not a problem. But for the first few days, I'm focusing on that herd bull. That's the challenge. I've got a week to go hunting. I'm going to go and try to find a big elk. But if I don't, I'm more than happy to fill the freezer at the end of that. But I love the challenge of hunting the herd bull. I love that challenge of trying to make it past the cows, trying to get in there and find that mature animal. We're going to talk about three keys that I feel are very important to successfully hunting a herd bull. And I do a lot of seminars on general elk hunting tactics, tips and tactics, um, methods that we use to be successful elk hunting. And people always come up afterwards and like, yeah, that's great for hunting the smaller bulls, but what do you do to hunt the big bulls? You know, I want to, I want to hunt a big bull and every time I try that, I bugle at them, they turn and run away. The herd bull takes his cows and leaves. How do you hunt a herd bull? So we're going to talk about that, and I think you'll find that a lot of the tactics we use to hunt the, any elk work just as well for herd bulls with a couple small modifications. We're going to talk about location, we talk about timing, and then we're going to talk about the tactics and the methods that we use for actually hunting the herd bulls. So first one's location. I do all of my hunting 100% on public land. Probably 75% of it's just on a general over-the-counter type tag. So I walk into a Walmart, I buy a tag like everyone else and go out hunting. Finding a herd bull in that kind of a situation can be difficult. They're pressured by a lot of people. There's fewer of them. The dynamics of the herd, the, the bull to cow ratio is a lot lower. You get into a limited controlled hunt, they manage it a little better, keep the bull to cow ratios higher. You've got a more mature age class of animals. And I love applying for tags, but unfortunately it takes a lot of points to draw a tag, especially here in Utah. So I don't get a hunt, you know, controlled hunts every year, so I'm more than happy to go and buy a tag and just be out there elk hunting. So we're doing that, public land, a lot of it's over the counter. The first thing I like to do is find an area, focus my efforts on finding an area that has a good percentage of mature bulls. And a lot of states publish statistics about those areas that give you the statistics of bull to cow ratio, uh, average age of the animals that are being shot in that unit. So you can get a good feel for, there's a 20% success rate on six point bulls. That's an area that's got good mature herd bulls in there. I might focus on that area. So I look for those statistics to try to narrow down where I'm going to hunt. And then I start my scouting. How many of you have used Google Earth? Show of hands. Google Earth is an incredibly powerful application for an elk hunter. I can jump on there once I narrow down that area and I can just do a flyover of the unit and I can start picking out areas that look really good for, for elk hunting. I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for food, I'm looking for water, and I'm looking for bedding areas. So for bedding areas, I'm just looking for a north-facing slope where those elk are going to go when it's hot or in the middle of the day and bed down. I'm looking for water sources, which on Google Earth you can see the green draws, you can see the areas where there's probably going to be some water. And I'm looking for open ridges where they can go out and have some feed. If I can find those three things relatively close to each other and relatively far away from a road, I'm going to be pretty excited about that. I'm not going to guarantee there's going to be elk there, but at least it gives me a jump start before I go out and start spending gas money and precious time during the summer trying to locate some elk. Uh, hunting GPS Maps, which is now Onyx Maps, has a great application that goes right along with Google Earth also. You can take it, put it into your computer, overlay it onto Google Earth. It'll show you all the unit boundaries, the private versus public land, all of that. 
So it's a great application to tie in with Google Earth and really helps me as I'm trying to really focus down. I don't want to get on Google Earth and find this great spot and then find out that there's a, a you know chunk of private land in the middle of it. So great application for that. Once I find that area on Google Earth, I'll look for probably four or five, six areas that look good to me. Then I'll go out and put my boots on the ground. Go out and do some scouting. And what I'm looking for at that point is signs of previous rut. I'm looking for cows during the summer. I don't want to find the group of bulls during the summer because they might be moving 8, 10, 12 miles looking for cows when the rut starts. I can put all this time and effort and find this big group of bulls and go back there the first week of September and they're gone. And they aren't even anywhere around and I don't see another sign of elk for probably another six weeks in there. So what I'm looking for is a big group of cows. The more cows I can find, the more chances there's going to be more herd bulls, more mature bulls coming in there gathering those cows up when the rut starts. And when the cows have their calves in the spring, typically where they have their calves is where they're going to spend the summer, and typically close to that location where those, is where those bulls are going to come to start the rut. So I'm looking for cows, looking for the signs of previous rut, I'm looking for rubs, I'm looking for wallows. If I'm finding rubs, there's a good chance that those bulls are going to be back to that same area rutting again that year. I'm looking for backup areas. As I mentioned, I find five or six areas on Google Earth. I want to make sure that I've got a couple of areas so that if hunters move in and push the elk out or, or make the elk so they aren't as vocal. Or in Idaho, we struggle a lot with wolves. If a pack of wolves moves in there, the elk will go completely quiet. It'll push them out of there. We struggled this year in Idaho. I called in my first bull in Idaho on day seven of our hunt this year. It took us seven days to find a bull that would bugle. And that's after spending almost every week in checking trail cameras, setting out trail cameras, scouting new areas. We moved our camp four times in those seven days, and finally on the fourth time we found a, a herd of elk to hunt. So having backup plans is incredibly important. If you put your, all your eggs in one basket to get caught in a rut out there, you can spend your eight days and not even hear a bugle or find an elk. So have some backup plans. I go out and set trail cameras. I love setting trail cameras. It's exciting to go back and, and check them a month or two later. I just see what's there, verify. Are there three or four cows in the area? Are there 40 or 50 cows in the area? Kind of give me a, a chance to say, okay, this is my primary area. There's cows all over here. There's going to be a lot of bulls here. Uh, we had an area three years ago, four years ago, that we set six trail cameras out. Every single trail camera in that drainage had cows on it like crazy. We had two spikes all summer, not a single bull other than that, and probably 70 or 80 cows that came in on those trail cameras. We went back to that area on September 12th, called in three herd bulls in a 24-hour period and shot three herd bulls within 60 yards of each other. That magic three or four days when those herd bulls come out of the mountains, they're looking for the cows to round them up. And if you can be there where those cows are when those herd bulls show up, it's incredibly fun as an elk hunter. And then the last thing I'll mention when it comes to location is paying attention to the weather. What kind of a winter did they have? What kind of a spring are they having? Are they having a lot of moisture throughout the summer? Last year, the reason we weren't finding elk, a lot of it had to do with wolves, but some of it had to do with the fact that we had a pretty hard winter. It wasn't a terrible hard winter, but it lasted a lot longer into the spring. The spring was cooler, and so the snow stayed on, and the grass didn't green as far up the mountain as it usually does. So the cows, as they're moving up the mountain, didn't get up near as far as they usually do when they had their calves. So they calved at a lot lower elevation, and they stayed there all summer. They were comfortable there, they were safe there, and they didn't move their calves back up the mountain. That meant the bulls had to travel farther down the mountain to find the cows when it was time to rut. And it took us a little while to, to hone that in. Trail cameras weren't getting very many pictures last year of cows. And by the time we realized what was going on, it was day seven of an eight-day hunt. And, and we had to, only two days really to get it done. So paying attention to that, if you have a wet spring, a lot of moisture there, going into a wet summer, the elk are not going to have to move very far because water's going to be wherever they're at. They're going to have food and water in abundance. They aren't going to have to travel a lot, so a lot of times you're finding them in pockets and they're kind of spread out. Water's on a short supply during a, a drought year. You might find the elk more concentrated around water supplies. So pay attention to some of that will help you as you're considering the location you're going to hunt. Next thing we'll talk about is timing. And for me, I feel that timing of when I'm hunting, especially hunting a herd bull, if I'm trying to hunt that big mature animal, my timing is going to be probably more critical than the location I'm hunting. And those herd bulls, we'll talk a little bit about the different phases of the rut, but hunting a herd bull, they act differently from day to day. And the way that you're going to approach hunting those and the method you're going to use is going to change day to day as well. We'll talk about the pre-rut, what they're doing during the pre-rut. Then we'll talk about the peak rut, what they're doing in the middle of the rut, and then also the post-rut. So during the, the pre-rut, during the summer, the bulls are bachelored up. They're in big herds. Sometimes I've seen 17, 18, 20, 24 bulls together during the summer. Really cool sight to see. But about August 1st, and it depends on area, but sometime that last part of July, first part of August, 
the bulls start getting a little agitated with each other, and they break up into their solo bands, they move off, and they, they go into what I call the staging area. So in the staging area, they'll stay there for anywhere from a week, sometimes two weeks, week, ten days, somewhere in there, by themselves, they're rubbing their antlers on trees, they're bedding right there, they aren't moving very far, they have food and water right there, they aren't interested in cows or anything at this point, they don't want other bulls around them, they're a little bit vocal, sometimes you'll hear them sound off once or twice in the morning, once or twice in the evening, but that's their staging area. And if you've ever been in an area where you get inside and there's 30 or 40 rubs just all over on trees within you know, an area the size of this room and there's six or eight beds in there, good chance that's a staging area. That's where that bull goes pre-rut before he goes and looks for the cows as he's getting away from the other bulls. It can be a great time to hunt those bulls. They aren't really vocal, but they're very agitated. If you get in close and start bugling, sometimes it's enough to fire them up and they come in there stomping in to chase you off because they don't want another bull around them. After that, they go down and they start gathering the cows. But during that time, sitting water can be effective. It's usually hot. It's that middle part of August into the last part of August. Weather's hot. The bulls are hitting water probably every day. Not necessarily wallowing yet, but coming to get a drink of water. So if it's a drought year, and you've got a couple good water holes with trail cameras on them, and the bulls are coming into that, it might be a good place to go and set for a little bit. Calling can be good. As I mentioned, those bulls are a little bit agitated. They don't want another bull coming in close. So if you can get one to sound off, and then slip in close to him and get him fired up, sometimes he'll come charging in. And I've had some experiences on August 28th, August 30th, that'll rival anything I've had on September 20th. A bull just gets fired up and starts thrashing and comes storming in. There's no cows to hold him back. He's by himself. And he comes flying into 20 yards there wanting to beat up the bull that's, that's bugling and challenging him there. The other thing I like to do is, is what I call the hybrid. And it's a mix between calling and spot and stock. So spot and stock elk hunters, my hat's off to them. They're way better elk hunter than I am. Be able to slip in close to a big bull like that without any calling. For me, the thrill of hunting is a calling though. So I can't just leave my bugle at home. I've got to take it with me and at least use it to get in close. From there, then we do kind of a spot and stalk, have a caller stay back behind while the shooter moves in quietly and, and tries to get a shot at that. That can be effective that time of year as well if the bull's staying in one area. If he's talking a little bit, you can sometimes slip in there while he's raking a tree or something and, and get a shot. The peak rut, this is what everybody lives for. This is that third week of September type of a thing where the bulls are screaming, they're vocal all day. This is exciting for an elk hunter but it can be really challenging for someone hunting a herd bull because those herd bulls a lot of times don't want to leave their cows. This is when the estrus is taking place. This is when the breeding is taking place. They don't want to come and fight another bull and take the chance of another bull coming in and taking their cows. So getting a herd bull to leave his herd and come into your setup, just calling strictly, can be very difficult. Some effective tactics, again, are the hybrid. I love that because you get the bull, they're very vocal, you can keep tabs on them, but then you move in as a shooter silently and you aren't taking a chance of bumping that bull, pushing him off as he rounds up his cows and, and moves out. Another thing that works good, if you can get in there, especially where there's a lot of bulls, high bull to cow ratio, just straight out calling. Just a setup with a shooter out front, a collar back behind, you're staying in a static position, trying to pull that bull into you, it can be very effective. And we'll talk about the methods that, that are effective for calling. And then lastly, when it comes to timing, you've got the post rut. So after the, the breeding's all done, the rut's over, those big bulls a lot of times just move off by themselves, go off and just lay in a brush patch by themselves for a month, six weeks, completely just recovering from the rut. They've got wore out, they've been beat up, they're tired, they haven't eaten, they have, you know, they're just, they're there resting, they're trying to recover before winter kicks in, and they aren't usually moving much. They'll come out on an open hillside and feed for a little bit in the morning or a little bit in the evening, but then they go and lay back down in that brush pile and they just don't move. They're, they can be really tough to find, let alone hunt during that time of year. But a couple of effective tactics, spot and stalk. If you can get up on a high vantage point and just do some glassing after the rut and find that bull feeding out on the ridge in the morning, sometimes they'll start to bachelor up a little bit to find a couple bulls working together. You find those out feeding in the morning or in the evening and go back the next day and just slip in quietly. You'll watch them go in bed down. They probably aren't moving too much and probably aren't moving too far. So spot and stalk's probably gonna be your best method for hunting the herd bull after the rut's over. So the tactics, this is the meat and potatoes. This is where the real excitement is for me. The, the tactic, how do you get that bull in there? Yeah, I've, I found a big bull. I found a group of elk that I want to go and hunt. I've figured out which week of vacation I'm taking this year. This is when I'm going. What's the tactic going to be? How am I going to get that bull in? How am I going to call it into range? How am I going to get within range to get a shot at it? And it's going to depend on a couple things. The two things we talked about, location and timing. My tactics are completely different if I'm hunting wide open country versus if I'm hunting 
you know, the thick timber and brush of northern Idaho. The tactics I use and the way that I set up are going to be different. And similarly, the timing is going to change. If I'm hunting the pre-rut, my tactic is going to be I'm not going to be quite as aggressive necessarily. If I'm hunting that transition period between the pre-rut and the peak rut, that three or four days when those bulls come out of the mountains and start gathering up the cows, I'm going to be really aggressive. I'm going to be hunting all day, going from daylight till dark as hard as I can because that, in my opinion, is the best three or four days to hunt a mature herd bull. Once they get their herds, it can be a lot more difficult. They're focused on their herds. They're focused on keeping their herds away from the other herds so they don't have to worry about bulls coming in and stealing them. They're moving a lot. Those cows are moving. The bulls are running around trying to tend the cows. It can be difficult to get a herd bull's attention during that time. Not impossible at all, but more difficult. If you can get there right during that transition period, that's the prime time. And it changes from state to state. It changes from year to year. But if I had to pick one week to go elk hunting and focusing on a herd bull, I'd probably be hunting around the 8th to the 15th maybe pushing it back a little bit to 10th to the 17th. But after that 17th, 18th on, it can be pretty tough because those bulls are herded up and, and have their harems. So there's three tac four tactics I'll talk about. Number one is water. And I am a very impatient person. I cannot sit for very long, especially if I hear an elk bugle. So if I'm sitting in a tree stand or sitting in a blind on a water hole and an elk bugles up the canyon, he's not coming to that water hole, I'm leaving the water hole. So I'm not a patient person, but if you're patient, and you have a trail camera out there and you have a pattern bull that's coming in every day at the same time, it can be a very effective way to hunt herd bulls, especially early in the season. Talk about spot and stock, leaving your calls at home. Just going out and finding a bull and trying to slip in close enough to get a shot. We'll talk about calling, which is my favorite. Setting up, calling that bull to you. He comes past the shooter, unaware that the shooter's there. The caller's back behind bringing him in comes right by for a great shot, that is a blast. There's nothing like having a big herd bull coming into 20 or 30 yards, screaming in your face, and getting a shot on him. And then the last one is the hybrid, mixing that calling and spot and stock. Calling for a certain amount of time, and then going quiet and moving in for the rest of the way for the final shot. When it comes to water, location is important. If you're hunting Arizona or somewhere where it's, it's a dry climate, water is going to be important for those elk. They're going to be coming to water holes every day, sometimes twice a day especially during the early part of the rut and during the middle of the rut when they're worked up and they're spending a lot of energy, water sources can be really valuable. Weather is going to play a big part of that. If you're hunting a year when it's really wet and there's water everywhere and you've had a lot of summer rainstorms, sitting on water is probably not going to be as effective. Those elk move around a little bit. They don't have to hit the same water hole every day. There's water everywhere, so patterning the elk is going to be difficult. As I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the phases of the, the pre-rut phase and the methods for that, if you can get in there during the pre-rut, you probably aren't going to be hunting a lot of elk over a wallow, an active wallow. They haven't started wallowing at that point. They're more coming into a water hole. So if you're hunting early, you're going to be looking for a water hole, a water source where they're coming in and watering every day. If you're hunting later during the middle of the rut, if you find a great big wallow that's being actively hammered every day, setting a trail camera on there and seeing what's coming in, a lot of times those bulls will come in that same part of the day every day for for sometimes three or four weeks there, and you can pattern them and have a, a great hunt there. And then lastly, tree stand versus ambush. If you're in a tree, it helps with scent control a little bit. Your scent's going out above the elk before it's dropping down. They aren't smelling you as, as much. Um, your visual is a lot better from a tree stand than if you're on the ground. Flip side though is you're stuck up in a tree. So if you're on the ground, you're a lot more mobile. If I'm going to hunt a water hole, I'm going to go and I'm going to set up either a, a little brush blind or just going to tuck myself into some brush next to the water hole. Because like I mentioned, once I hear an elk bugle, I'm jumping up and going. So I don't want to go through the effort of taking a tree stand in, setting it up, climbing up it, and then climbing back down every time I hear an elk bugle. So there are a couple of advantages to being in a tree stand, but if you're impatient like me and just want to run and gun with the elk, then just setting up on a water hole is probably going to be more effective for you than climbing up in a tree. Spot and stock. Very effective. Also very good hunters. My good friend Ron there in the picture that's all he does. He very, very rarely carries an elk call with him. If he does, it's just to locate the elk. From there, he spots a bull, gets his spotting scope, binoculars out, sits up on a ridge, finds a bull that he wants to hunt, and then goes to it and just shadows it. Sometimes all day he'll follow that bull. Staying back, moving up five or ten yards at a time. When the bull turns his head, he'll creep in a little bit closer. The guy is incredibly patient, incredibly quiet, and incredibly good hunter. Kills bulls like that almost every year on general tags or limited draw tags that are really easy to draw. Killed two bulls like that last year, one in Montana, one in Wyoming, simply by shadowing that bull. That one was very early, I think September 1st, September 2nd. Didn't have any cows, came out on a ridge in the morning and started feeding there. He slipped in and followed it for a while. 
moving in, keeping you know, sagebrush trees between him and the bull, and finally moved into range. The bull turned and made a mistake and came by him and he got a shot, and he does it every year. The key to it is finding the elk. If you aren't using your calls to necessarily call them in, you're either going to be glassing them, setting up on a ridge, looking for them as they're out feeding, and then moving in, watching where they bed, similar to hunting mule deer, or you can use your calls to locate them and then move in from there, knowing that if you're calling to them, they might go quiet, they might feel a little bit of pressure and move away, so getting in close and calling might not be the, the best method there. The key to it is moving in quietly. So you're wanting to get in there, every time that elk makes a move, turns his head or whatever, you move a step or two closer. But inside that 150, 200 yards, especially out in open country like that, it can be difficult to cover that ground and get into 40 or 50 yards for a shot. So taking your time, being patient, making moves at the right time when the elk's head's down, turned away, when the wind's blowing. We had a bull that was bedded several years ago and he would not come in. He was bugling every three minutes from his bed during the middle of the day, but he wouldn't get up and come in. So my buddy stayed back at 200 yards and said, you just slip in quiet. It took three hours to get into that bull, but there was fires that year in Idaho, and every time a plane would fly over, it made noise and allowed me to move in five or 10 yards. Pretty soon I popped up over a little rise, the bull's bedded there at 30 yards. I slipped into 18 yards of him and shot him out of his bed there. So spot and stalking can be very effective, but it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot more time than just getting them to come in with bugles. With bugles, it's a fight and it's usually over pretty quick. Spot and stalk can take sometimes all day. Wind is critical in that situation. You've got to be paying attention to wind because if that bull smells anything, if the wind switches, you spent three hours or belly crawling up on this bull and you pop your head up and the wind switches, it's game over. So making sure that you're paying attention to what the thermals are doing. If it's midday and the thermals are going up and the shadows start coming out, wind's going to be switching. You've got to take that into account. Sometimes that means backing out and trying again the next day. But always paying attention to wind, knowing what the wind's doing then, as well as what it's going to be doing in an hour when you're still trying to get up close to that bull. Then the third one is calling, and for me, that's the thrill. I love that vocal interaction with the elk. I love fooling the elk into thinking I'm another bull, getting them so mad that they come charging in, wanting to fight another bull, not even knowing that there's a shooter out in front there to get a good shot on them. I love the two-person setup. And I've mentioned it several times, but having that collar back behind and the shooter out in front, the shooter's completely silent. He goes out and, and posts up there in a good shooting lane or several good shooting lanes. The collar's back behind. The collar's the only one making noise. He's back there calling. His focus is to bring that bull past the shooter. How many of you have had a bull that you've been calling to, calling to, he comes into 80 yards and stops out there and will not come closer? If you have a shooter 40 yards out in front, all of a sudden he's in shooting range. And it's very effective. It's, I love hunting that way. If I'm hunting by myself, I feel like I'm handicapped because I've got to bring that bull all the way in by myself and get a shot. He's got me pinpointed. Once I make a noise, that bull knows where I'm at. If he comes 80 yards and he can see where there should be an elk and doesn't see one, he's probably not coming closer. So I've got to get creative in my setups and make sure that he's not coming in and able to see me from a long ways away. I've got to cast my bugles back behind me and my cow calls back behind me in the hopes of drawing him close enough that I can get a shot. So having two people, there's definitely an advantage there. So as I'm setting up, if I'm the shooter out in front, I like to remember the word arc. An arc has two meanings when I'm setting up on, uh, on calling in an elk. First one is always remember concealment, A-R-C, always remember concealment. An elk's trying to stay alive. He's got three senses that he uses to do that. He's got sight, sound, and smell. So as I'm setting up, I'm remembering to conceal myself from all three of those senses, making sure the wind's good. He's not going to smell me. Making sure that I'm set up in front of some brush so that my camouflage is able to work and I'm concealed from his sight. If I set up behind a tree or behind brush or behind a rock, he can come to 20 yards and be right out in the wide open, but if I'm behind that tree, I'm not getting a shot. So I set up in front of obstacles, let the camouflage break up my outline using that backdrop. And then also sound. The last thing I want to do is have that bullet 20 yards and try to draw on him and he hears me break a branch as I shift my weight or as I break a branch coming to full draw. So I'm making sure the ground's cleared out of my feet, make sure there's no branches or brush behind me that's going to make noise when I draw, concealing myself. Always remember concealing. The second thing is an arc, literally, ge geometrically an arc. So if you think of a bull coming into the collar, straight line from the bull to the collar, if the wind's going across that straight line, the bull is typically going to come in downwind. Sometimes in the middle of the rut they go crazy and they forget about their senses and they come flying right in. That's wonderful. But 90% of the time, those elk are coming in a little bit curious and a little bit cautious. And they're usually going to circle downwind to make sure there's no danger there as they approach that setup. So having that shooter set up on an imaginary arc that's downwind of that straight line from the collar to the bull is very important. If you set up right in the middle of that straight line and the bull circles downwind, he's going to smell the shooter before he gets into a shooting lane. 
your scent's coming out a little bit of a cone shape, he's gonna smell that hit before he gets diagonal to you and gets into a shooting lane. So it's important to get down at least 40 or 50 yards. That way if he does come storming straight in, you're still within good bow range. If he comes in downwind though, he's not smelling you as he comes across there. So I like to set up a little bit downwind and getting on the same level will help with that. And there's a couple reasons I like to get on the same level as the elk when I'm setting up. Number one, if you're up on top of a mountain looking straight down, you can see a lot better than if you're at the bottom looking up. If an elk comes in from above you and he's looking down, <coughs> if he gets to 100 yards, he should be able to see where you're calling from. He can see where you're calling from and he should be able to see an elk. If he doesn't, he's probably not coming down the hill any farther. On the flip side, if a bull's coming up the hill to you, you got to remember you're a bull elk. You're up there convincing him you're another bull elk. You're challenging him, you want to fight him. He's at a physical disadvantage coming up that hill to you. So getting the bull to come charging straight up a mountain to you can be difficult as well. If you get on the same level, it kind of eliminates their visual advantage, makes them feel like they're not at a physical disadvantage, and makes them feel more comfortable to come in. The second thing it does is think about the thermals. What are they doing throughout the day? In the morning they're coming down, during the day they're going up. They typically don't blow side hill. If there's a storm or something, sometimes you'll get swirling winds. But if the wind switches as you're moving in on an elk, it usually goes from blowing downhill to blowing uphill or blowing uphill to downhill. If you're coming in at the same level as that elk and the, and the wind switches on you, chances are it's not going to be as bad and an elk's probably not going to smell you because it's either going to blow down and up or up and down. If you're coming down that same level, you've still got a little bit of leeway there. So I like to get on the same level as the elk and move in. Helps me with the thermals, helps with the elk's physical advantage, helps with, the, with my visual advantage and uh, makes it a lot easier to call in the elk. So I get on the same level, and again, I can't stress enough the importance of paying attention to the wind. If an elk smells you, the hunt's over. Once in a while, you get a bull that's so dumb in the rut that he forgets that he just smelled something and will come in anyways because he just keeps hearing that cow sound, but typically, 99% of the time, if a bull smells you and gets your wind, the hunt's over. So always pay attention to the wind. When it comes to calling, I get questioned a lot. Why are you so aggressive? Why do you bugle so much? We had somebody on opening day in Idaho this year that left a nice note on our pickup window when we got back to it and said, if you were up this drainage this morning, you bugle way too much. I'll admit I do, <coughs> but I love it and it works. So we've got a, a really good system that's worked really well for us for calling in small bulls, big bulls, it doesn't matter. Any bull, think about what a bull's thinking about in September. Two emotions that they have. They either want to fight or they want to breed. If you're playing to one of those two emotions on the right day, there's a good chance that bull's going to come in. If it's a day that bull's wanting to breed and he's got a cow that's hot and you're giving him some good cow calls, that might be all it takes. You might not need to bugle. But if that bull has his cows and he's just tired of getting pestered by other bulls and he's, he's ready to fight, you've got to challenge him and make him want to fight. So playing to their emotions, I always start out with a cow call. If I can get a bull coming in with a cow call, that's simple. If he wants to come into a cow call and he's excited to check that out, I'll give him cow calls all he wants to hear as long as he's coming in. The key to calling a bull with bugles and challenging them to get in, though, is being close. If you're 400 yards away from this bull and you're throwing out challenge after challenge after challenge to him, he's a lot of times going to grab his cows, he's going to herd them up, and he's going to move out. And that's what a lot of people, you'll hear them say, you can't call in herd bulls. They grab their cows and move. I've chased them for four miles now, bugling at them. They won't turn and come back in. The key to calling in any elk, especially a herd bull, is getting in close to him before you challenge him. So our, our main method is going up on a ridge, throwing out a location bugle to find an elk. And a location bugle is just like a two-note bugle, carries that high note out there, it echoes across the canyon. All I'm saying is, I'm an elk up here, are there any other elk out there? It sounds like this. Nothing aggressive, not a lot of intensity. I just want that note to carry out there. I want the elk to hear it from a mile away and bugle back. Once I hear him bugle back, I know there's a bull there. Then I can move in and, and start my actual calling setup. So I move in close as the caller. Remember, we have two people, so the shooter's out front. As the caller back behind, my job is just to bring that bull in front of the shooter. So we get on the same level, we get the wind in our favor, and then the caller drops back. And it depends on the terrain. If you're hunting wide open country, sometimes it's going to have to be 100 yards, 120 yards. Hunting thick brush or, or heavy timber, sometimes we can get away with being a lot closer. But 40 to 60 yards is kind of that magic range that I've found that those bulls typically can't see where you're at. They come in at least within range of the shoe drop in front. So my job as a caller is to bring that bull in. And I start out with just cow sounds. Like I mentioned, if he's excited about cows, all I have to do is give him some cow sounds and he's going to come in. <coughs> 
nothing hyperestrous, just some cow sounds. If that bull hears cow sounds and he wants a cow that day, he's going to come into those cow sounds. Now, if he doesn't want a cow that day, and he's not wanting to get up, he doesn't want to leave his herd or whatever, he's still probably going to respond to that cow. It's September. He's gathering a herd. He's thinking about the rut. He's thinking about breeding. If he hears cow sounds and you're inside that 120 to 150 yard range, he's probably going to bugle back at you or make some kind of a noise. He might not be aggressive. He might not be meaning anything by it, but he's going to make a noise. That's when I challenge him. As soon as he makes that noise, I'm cutting him off. I'm hammering him with all the intensity and emotion, frustration, anger, everything I can to challenge him. And my challenge bugle sounds like this. Can you hear the difference in intensity between that and the location bugle? Let me do it back to back. I'll do the location bugle first and then the challenge. Can you hear the difference in intensity? The elk can too. They react by emotion. If you get in close to a bull elk and you cow call to him and he responds and says, hey, it's September. I'm a bull, you're a cow. And all of a sudden, this great big bull comes screaming over the top of him and challenges him and says, uh-uh, this is my cow. And you're 120 or 150 yards away from him, he loses his mind. First thing he thinks of, his eyes roll back in his head, and he comes charging, and he's like, I'm going to beat up that bull. And that's what I want to get that bull to say. I want to get him so mad that he comes in wanting to beat me up. Because when he does, he drops his guard, he forgets about his senses, he's slobbering all over himself, and he comes running in there wanting to beat me up. Well, me as a caller, I pulled him back or across in front of the shooter. The shooter gets a good shot, and it's game over. So, honestly, that is our sequence. It's that simple. A cow sound and a challenge bugle. And the key to it is being close. That won't work from 300 or 400 yards away, typically. Typically, you've got to be inside that 150 is, is kind of what I call the red zone. If you can get inside that zone and challenge a bull like that, there's a good chance he's coming in. Works on big bulls, little bulls. We uh, did a seminar in, in Denver about a month ago and had several people come up, yeah, but we've got so many raghorns here. If we bugle like that, they're all going to turn and run to Utah. I said they won't if you're close. If you're a long ways away, yeah, they will. We've called in spikes, literally got in 100 yards from a spike that was sitting there. Didn't even know if he was a cow or a bull. He was cow calling, he was bugling. It was the craziest thing. I let out some cow calls and he let out this little squeal and I hammered him with the biggest challenge bugle you can imagine. His eyes rolled back in his head and started foaming at the mouth and he ran into 10 yards and stood there and still didn't know what sound to make. But it's a natural reaction, an emotion within them that during September that testosterone's kicking in and when they get challenged like that, they just come in wanting to fight. So it works on little bulls, big bulls, especially herd bulls, it can be effective. But again, I can't stress enough, the key is getting in close. So you've got to slip in quiet to get set up, get in there on that bull, then set up inside that red zone, give him the cow call, when he responds, challenge him. Now on the flip side, if you were to bugle first from that range, he can cut you off and challenge you. And then he's basically putting the ball in your court and saying, all right, buddy, you've come in close here, you can bugle, I've challenged you, come up here and let's fight. And as you stay back there giving him cow calls and bugles again, he's like, that's what I thought. You're not tough enough, you're scared to come up here. And he gets, loses interest, grabs his cows and leaves. Always respond back to him. Cow call first to get him to respond. Once he bugles, then you cut him off with the bugle. You put the ball in his court. You've challenged him, and it's up to him to come into you. A couple other options for calling in herd bulls. I love raking a tree. Just picking up a stick as the caller. I let out a bugle, and I start thrashing a tree with the stick like the bulls do. That's a display of dominance for him. So as I'm displaying dominance, sometimes that bull won't quite come in with just the calls. I start displaying dominance. It's like, that's it. You've challenged me. Now you're trying to act like you're tougher than me, and they'll come flying in. The other thing I love about raking is when you start raking a tree, it's a display of dominance, and that bull a lot of times will start doing the same thing to display his dominance. When a bull starts raking a tree, prime time as a shooter out in front to get up and move in 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards. Sometimes move all the way in and shoot that bull with his head's down, eyes are closed, he's making sound. It's a great time to stalk in on that bull. I had a bull probably five or six years ago that would not break loose from his cows. He'd come down the hill 40 or 50 yards, start raking a tree, and then go back up to the cows and back and forth. My buddy was back behind probably 100 yards calling, did it for probably 40 minutes and the same thing. They, the cows were bedded up there, the bull was fired up, but he just wouldn't come down and leave his cows. My buddy started raking a tree. That bull came down to 50 yards, 50 yards down the hill, and started raking a tree, and he raked that tree for 15 minutes. While he was raking it, I was slipping up the hill, and I went from 120 yards into 55 yards, pulled out the rangefinder, 
Hey, I didn't I thought 55 yards? It's inside my range. He doesn't know I'm here. He's quartered away, but I can get closer. I slipped into about 43 yards, pulled up the range finder, hit him at 43 yards, still quartering away, head down, tearing this tree up. 43 yards, that's a chip shot. Not moving, doesn't know I'm here, but I can get closer. I shot that bull quartering away at 35 yards. He had no idea I was there. He had no idea he'd been shot. I shot him and he jumped a little bit and stood there and looked around and walked off about 15 yards and fell over right there. So raking a tree can be very effective to get in close on a herd bull. The other thing we like to use is decoys. Decoys are kind of a last resort for me, not because they don't work, but just because I don't have it figured out. There's no rhyme or reason for me why or when decoys work. Sometimes you throw up a decoy and a bull will come running from 300 yards into it. Other times you pull one up and the bull will whirl and run and, and act like he's scared of it. So if I'm calling to a bull and I've got visual and he just won't come in, sometimes as a caller I'll just take a heads up decoy, hold it out there, flash it to him a little bit, give a couple cow calls and then drop it back down just to give him that visual confirmation that, okay, I'm hearing a sound there, I'm seeing an elk now, I, I think it's safe to go in. So a decoy will work good. The thing I don't want to do is get out there and, and use it first and take a chance scaring that bull away. But at that point, it's 50-50. If I'm having troubles getting that bull in, sometimes a decoy will work, sometimes it won't. It just improves my, my chances of getting close to that elk after I've tried everything else. And then the last method is the hybrid. This is just a combination of spot and stock and calling. Our calling sequence and setup and everything is the same. We get in as close as we can, we throw out some cow sounds, we get the bull to bugle, we cut him off. We do that as much as we can. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes those herd bulls, they've been pressured, they've got a cow that's in heat, they don't want to leave, and we can't get those bulls to break loose and come into our setup. At that point, as the shooter, I just get up and start spotting and stalking. The caller's still back there working his magic, keeping the bull active, keeping the bull vocal. The shooter just gets up and moves in, keeping tabs on that bull. Once you get a visual, then you're moving very slow, just like in spot and stock. You're patient, you're taking your time, waiting for that bull to make a mistake, waiting for him to circle back behind the herd and come into bow range and give you a shot. Again, I like to get inside 150 yards before we start this, and if we get in there sometimes, it works great. A lot of times out in front as a shooter, I'll be calling. That way I'm closer than the caller back behind. I'm threatening that bull a little bit. I'm inside that red zone. I'm pressuring him a lot. And then as he starts responding, the caller back behind will kind of take over. The bull's fired up at that point, and I can move in as the shooter out in front and get a shot. We've got a really good video here that demonstrates from this past season in Idaho the hybrid situation that we talked about. So we'd located a bull from across the canyon at daylight that morning. We dropped down to the bottom. And we're trying to just pinpoint where he's at right here. Gave a couple cow sounds, he bugled. My buddy Dirk's there, four-time world champion elk caller. It's always good to have somebody like that calling for you. He moved back behind, I went out in front. It was my day to shoot, his day to call. And we slipped in on this bull. Got into probably 120, 150 yards of him. As you can see it's thick timber there. So we're able to move in pretty close to him before we start feeling like we're gonna pressure him or bump him. Maybe a little more volume on that. So the bull's off to my left in some real thick brush. I turn my head to the right to cow call to try to pull him across into some more open country there to our right. And it worked. He bugled from straight up ahead of me there, so we moved up into the open. Good spot to set up. Got a good cover to keep him coming. He's got to come in close to us there. Really good setup I'm confident in. So at this point, I'm still calling. Dirk's back behind me, probably 60 yards, but I'm still calling, putting pressure on that bull. And you see there, he called. As soon as he called, I cut him off with the challenge bugle, moved ahead a few feet. And we're getting close enough now that I'm feeling I should be able to see him out there in about 100 yards. So with 
both Dirk and I viewed one that bull thinks there's two bulls down there getting fired up about something. He's got his cows up there, but he just can't leave us alone. He knows there's something going on. We're challenging him. Every time he bugles, we're focused on his bugle, not necessarily calling back and forth to each other, but calling it over the top of the bull when he bugles. At this point, I caught a glimpse of him moving through the timber up there. I set my bugle down. I'm done calling at this point. But I also know that breaking that bull away from his herd might be pretty tough. He's got cows up there. He's been bugling all morning, moving up the mountain. So as I see him go across up there, I go into spot and stalk him. At this point, I'm thinking I'm probably going to have to get up on the edge of that timber where I keep seeing him to get in for a shot. Again, Dirk cuts him off every time the bull bugles. Dirk cuts him off with a challenge bugle. Fortunately, he got tired of us pestering him and challenging him, and he turned and came in. I could hear him, hear his hooves hitting the rocks as he came through the boulders that are coming down to us. Now, again, this is day seven in Idaho. This is the first bull we've called in in seven days. This is an over-the-counter unit in the middle of one of the most heavily hunted and heavily wolf-infested areas in Idaho. Keeping a little suspense there. Full film will be shown at the Full Draw Film Tour here in Salt Lake this summer. So if you want to see the whole thing, it's about 18 minutes. All of our dead batteries, our 15-mile hike days because we got stranded and our battery died in our truck. All the fun that goes into elk hunting, seven days of not finding an elk, that being our first call in, you get to see the shot and then the exciting aftermath of that. So that's how it works for us. Um, I love getting out in front like that. Fortunately, that time the bull turn came in, but that was the start of our, our hybrid. Moving in on that bull when he's up there with his cows moving back and forth, trying to just move in silently, patiently getting in there and, and finding that shot. In a nutshell, it's important to scout. If you're wanting to hunt a herd bull, if you want to hunt that representative animal of the area, that one animal out of the herd, if that's your challenge and that's what's exciting for you, you've got to hunt somewhere where there are herd bulls. So scouting is important. Getting in shape is important. We started our hunt at about 5,000 feet and shot that elk at about 7,600 feet. That was the first bull that we called in in seven days. We hunted, we hiked 65 miles in the first six days on GPS without a single call in. Being in shape is important, especially hunting public land on over-the-counter type tags. If you draw a good hunt, go out there and there are bulls running everywhere, yeah, you can get by without being in shape. But the more that you're able to do, the more dedication you're able to put in right now during the off-season to being in shape, the better chances are that you're going to be able to track down an elk and get in on it for a shot. Extend your shooting. I'm not saying you have to be proficient at 120 yards and be able to shoot an elk that far. That's way outside my range, but I practice every day out to 100 yards. I would never shoot that far in the field. But shooting at 100 yards makes me feel really comfortable when I'm shooting at 40 yards. It seems a lot easier. My form's a lot better because at 100 yards, every little thing that I do wrong is magnified about 4x when I'm shooting 30 yards. So I practice out to long ranges just so that I'm comfortable inside my shooting range. It extends my range a little bit more as I'm spotting and stalking. It can be difficult to get into 20 yards on those bulls. It can happen if you're in thick country. But a lot of times when you're spotting and stalking those bulls, even if hybrid, your shot's going to be out there at 40 or 50 yards. So practicing at longer ranges makes you feel a lot more confident in shooting 40 or 50 yards or whatever your effective range is with the bow. Be flexible and versatile. We moved our camp four times in seven days last year. I've learned lessons in the past of putting all eight of my days into one basket and not getting into any elk. And finally it's the last day and I'm desperate, I panic, my hunt's almost over, and I've wasted the entire time because I haven't been able to find elk. I'm versatile, I'm mobile, I'm moving continually until I find a herd of elk to hunt. And my tactics are going to change sometimes day to day. If calling's not working, spot and stalk might work. We were in Wyoming last year. First four days, the elk were screaming their heads off. It was the most insane bugling action I've heard. We didn't call in a single elk, though. Every time we got inside 200 yards and tried to cow call or bugle, they'd go quiet and move away. We had to switch up our tactics and started, they were very vocal, so it made it easy to spot and stalk them. But every time we tried calling in close, they would go quiet. So we had to change our tactics from calling to simply spot and stalk. We'd locate a bull, move in, just keep shadowing him until he made a mistake. Be versatile in that. And then be realistic. What is your goal? Is it a 400 inch bull? Did you draw the San Juan archery tag this year? Yeah, you can set some goals like that if you want to. 
where you hunt in Idaho over the counter in a heavily hunted, heavily wolf pressured area, your goal might be just to hopefully hear an elk or, or see an elk. Be realistic in those. Know your expectations ahead of time. Don't pass up a bull on the first day you'd shoot on the last day. I love it when people say that. I've passed up so many elk on the first day that I spent the next six days trying to find because I couldn't find any other elk. I'll, I'll shoot a spike on the last day, but I'm probably not going to shoot one on the first day. So, but be realistic in that. Know what you want to do, know what you're trying to accomplish, and then go out there and accomplish that. And most importantly, have fun. That's why we elk hunt. It's not a competition between elk hunters. It's a competition between you and the elk. You're trying to convince them that you're another elk. You're trying to overpower their senses and get in there and get a shot on them. It's not to outdo your neighbor. Fun little side bets are fun on, on hunting elk, but when it becomes a competition, it takes the fun out of it. It puts pressure on you to go out and shoot a bigger bull than somebody else, and it takes that fun away from it. Remember why we hunt. Remember the thrill of the hunt and the excitement of the hunt is being out there and experiencing some of those things. Success is defined by you. Make sure that you're defining it realistically and having fun as you're, as you're achieving that success. So thanks for coming. I'd love to stay here and chat and uh, answer any questions. We've got about 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so until we've got to be completely out of here. But we're over at the Extreme Elk Magazine booth. If anybody wants to come over there, it's booth 710. I'll stand out there and chat elk until 7 o'clock tonight if you guys want to. So love answering questions, love asking questions, getting your experiences. So feel free to fire out some questions. And before we get out of here, I want all the kids that are here to come up. I've got something special for you up here. And then we've got this box full of gear. So I'll reward questions with it. I'll throw out some gear and uh, we'll get some of your experiences and questions. Right here. Can I ask you, uh, I heard elk part of it, and I, I like I like using the water pool method. I, one of my big fears from closing that distance is, is, is usually I'm hunting in areas where there's lots of elk. And you say that you want to get in.